this evening. We're going to have August Nim speaking on busing. What are the issues? The racist offensive in Boston. Uh, professor Nims, assistant professor in political science at the University of Minnesota, is a black scholar and activist. He received his initial political experience in the South in the civil rights movement of Dr. Martin Luther King. Nims is currently co-chairman of the Minnesota National Student Coalition Against Racism. Uh, the format of this is going to be that Dr. Nims is going to give his presentation, and then we're going to have a question and answer period. During the question and answer period, we ask people to try to formulate their questions precisely, and we ask for a three-minute limit on questions or comments, and we'll try to call on um, people, everyone once, before we let one person speak again. Um, after the lecture, there's going to be a reception held at the Black Cultural Center, and that's 511 Welch. Everyone is welcome to come to the reception. It's Dr. Nibs. For many of us, the events in Boston surrounding the desegregation of public schools seems very distant. Events that are deplorable but far from our own existence. Events that reveal once more the racist nature of American society. But perhaps no different from the racism we encounter in our daily lives are aware of here in places like uh, Ames, Iowa. What I would like to do tonight is to make the case that the events in Boston are more than business or racism as usual. I want to argue that Boston represents a critical juncture in the struggle of black people for full equality in America. I want to contend that the stakes are high in the battle taking place there between the forces of equality on one side and the forces of racism and repression on the other, and that the future of the black struggle may very well hinge on the outcome of this contest. To make my case, I want to look back in time and review with you the recent history, the recent history of the black liberation movement. An understanding of this history of the black liberation struggle will reveal, I think, the significance of Boston. And at the same time, will reveal to us what our course of action must be. That is, those of us who are on the side of black people for obtaining full equality in the United States. Now, in May 1960, 1954, pardon me, the United States Supreme Court ruled that racially separate schools were inherently unequal and thus discriminated against black people. A year later, in June, the court ruled that desegregation of schools must proceed with all deliberate speed. Now, I remember first hearing about this ruling on the part of the Supreme Court. I was a youth in an all-black elementary school in New Orleans. While we were overjoyed at hearing the news, we did not need the Supreme Court to tell us that we were getting an unequal education. Although our parents paid taxes just as the parents of white students, we got inferior schools. We would get out of date textbooks, used textbooks, we used to call them hand-me-downs. They would be sent over from the white schools after they had been used there. They would send them over to the black schools and would expect us to be grateful for having had them sent over. The white schools would get the best and the latest in science laboratory equipment, while we used in our schools 
instruments that had more value as collector's items and would have been more appropriate in somebody's museum. White teachers were able to take leaves in order to improve themselves. For a black teacher, this meant crossing many hurdles while at the same time being paid an inferior salary. So it was not surprising that we were happy to see this ruling because for the first time in this century, the highest body of the judicial branch of government recognized that black people had a right to equal educational opportunities. In a society that not only believed, but actively illustrated to us through segregated schools that we were unequal and therefore could not expect equal treatment, this was indeed a landmark decision. This decision was to have a revolutionary impact on the consciousness of black people. Because before this ruling, and this is important to understand, before this ruling, most of us did not expect and did not actually believe we were entitled to equal treatment. We accepted inequality as an inherent part of our lives. But now the highest court in the land was saying that we were entitled to equal education. Now don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand me. The United States Supreme Court did not come to this decision out of the goodness of its white liberal heart. World events had dictated to the United States in 1954 that it would have to change. The United States would have to change its image it projected abroad, especially to the peoples of color who were beginning to assert their independence from Western imperialism. Remember that this was a decision that came on the heels of the Chinese Revolution and the struggle of the Korean people for self-determination. There was a colonial revolution in progress in the early 50s. And with the loss of China from the Western orbit, the US was fearful that further struggles would also take the course of the Chinese struggle. Thus, it was necessary for the United States to change its image rather than being an oppressor of peoples of color, people who compose the overwhelming majority of the world's population, it had to present an image of a society where people of color could be equal under the particular socioeconomic system we have known as capitalism. This fact about the world events, the objective situation of the world, was not lost upon the Supreme Court. In its brief before the U.S. Supreme Court, the Justice Department noted the following, which took into account this objective situation in the world. In that brief, the Justice Department said, it is in the context of the present world struggle between freedom and tyranny that the problem of racial discrimination must be viewed. Racial discrimination furnishes grist for the communist propaganda mills, and it raises doubt even among friendly nations as to the intensity of our devotion to the democratic faith. In that same brief, then Secretary of State Dean Acheson was to submit the following statement. The segregation of school children on a racial basis is one of the practices in the United States which has been singled out for a hostile foreign comment in the United Nations and elsewhere. Other people cannot understand how such a practice can exist in a country which professes to be a staunch supporter of freedom, justice, and democracy. Thus, is what the Justice Department, the Secretary of State were saying here, was that the racial situation in the United States, as reflected in the schools especially, was hurting the efforts of US foreign policy makers to win friends and influence people abroad, especially in the 
developing world. It was in this context that the U.S. Supreme Court decision must be understood and why it was handed down. This decision had a monumental impact on the course of the black struggle. Because black people began to say that since the highest court in the land recognizes that we have a right to equal education, then we should have equality in every aspect of our lives. Thus, it was not surprising that the first things that we began to struggle against were those system of laws that were designed to make us feel on a day-to-day -day basis, minute-to-minute -minute basis, that we were not equal. These were known as the Jim Crow laws. Some historians of the black civil rights struggle argue that the struggle began in 1955 when a black woman by the name of Rosa Parks, who had been the NAACP secretary in Montgomery, Alabama, decided that day in Montgomery that she was not going to ride in the back of the bus anymore. She was not going to get up and give her a seat, as was the custom, to a man simply because he was white and moved to the back of the bus. Now, for some of us who may not know, or perhaps have forgotten, or prefer not to remember, we had this system in the South on the public buses, which was a part of the Jim Crow system, that was particularly annoying and humiliating. I'll describe it as it was in New Orleans. It was quite similar to other places in the South. But as soon as you got on the bus, and after you gave the bus driver your fare, the first thing you did as a black person was to look down both sides of the bus to see where the signs were located. There were signs which said, in one form or another, that black people had to sit behind these signs. In some cities, there were very big signs. They were like a screen. They wanted to protect white people their vision from even seeing black people. So black people had to sit behind these screens. In other cities, which were considered a bit more liberal like New Orleans, the signs were not as conspicuous, but they were still there. And on these signs were, were written, was written the words, for colored only. And you had to make sure wherever you sat on the bus that you had to be behind this, this sign. Now these signs could be moved. And if you were black and you were sitting behind this sign and there happened to be some seats behind you, a white person could come on the bus and ask you to get up and move to occupy some of the seats behind you. And you had to move, pick up your sign, put it in front of you, and uh, sit in the back of the bus. Now, this was an extremely serious system. This was no plaything. If you did not get up and go to the back of the bus, you could be arrested. Some places you were lucky to be arrested. In many small towns, black people have not been heard of since because they had decided not to go along with the idea of sitting behind this sign or in the back of the bus. They were killed. So this was a very serious system. So it was no surprise that we began to attack this system because it was extremely humiliating and very annoying. And this was something that we had to go along with every day in the South as long as we were black and where Jim Crow laws existed. So it is no surprising that some people date the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement with the refusal by Rosa Parks to go to the back of the bus. As a result of her, her refusal and her arrest, black people in Montgomery, Alabama decided that they were not going to go along with this anymore. Two years before, the Supreme Court had ruled that black people had a right to equal education. Thus, it was not surprising that black people began to say then we should have equal opportunities for all aspects of our lives. The Montgomery struggle around the desegregation of buses was to lead to the fame of Martin Luther King. It was here in Montgomery in 1955 that Martin Luther King came into national prominence. The struggle around busing began there and it moved on from the issue of busing and seating in the back of the bus to separate and unequal lunch counter facilities. 
This led to the famous sit-in demonstrations in the early 1960s. The sit-in demonstrations were followed by the famous Freedom Rides. These were attempts to integrate interstate transportation facilities. Following the success in this struggle, we began to focus on basic political rights. Most importantly, the right to vote. Although in the Reconstruction period after the Civil War, black people had been promised the right to vote and did vote in that brief period in American history extensively, for 100 years or less, black people were denied the right to vote in the former Confederate states. It was an extremely difficult process, many hurdles. There were such things known as white primaries. The South argued that the primary system was a private organization, a private club, and therefore it could decide who could vote or not in the primary. Uh, the registration system was extremely cumbersome. It was not uncommon that you would go to the registration office after locating it, finding out when it would be open, and would be asked to recite sections of the Constitution before you could register to vote. I remember in 1963 trying to register to vote in New Orleans, and I had gone to the NAACP registration school. You see, we had set up schools in the South that you had to go to in order to learn how to register because we had to find out what the latest tricks were in the registration office before we could find out whether or not, uh, before we could uh, pass the latest exams. So we would go to the schools and after going to the schools, we would go to the registration office. So I had been to the school for a few days and went down to the registration office and thought I was ready to be registered. After locating the registration office, uh, which was a problem because sometimes they moved it and it was not always certain what days the registration office would be open. I filled out the application form. The man behind the desk looked at it, read it, and he said, I'm sorry, but uh, you can't register. And I asked why not. He said, because you made a mistake on the application form. I said, what mistake are you referring to? He said, these blanks you left here, there's nothing in them. I said, well, it didn't apply to me. And he said, well, I'm sorry. You should have drawn a line through them. And I said, well, I didn't know we were supposed to do that. And he said, yes, you do. You will have to come back at a later time. I didn't register that day, and I was on my way out of town, and I never registered in New Orleans. I remember registering in Indiana in 1968, and I remember some people came around to my apartment to register me. And after I filled out the form, they told me I was uh, registered, and I couldn't believe it. It took me a long time to believe I'd actually been registered. After all the trouble I'd been through in the South, it, uh, I simply couldn't believe it was this easy to exercise the basic political right to vote. So thus we began moving from these Jim Crow discriminatory laws to basic issues such as the right to vote. The struggle around the right to vote was perhaps the, the bloodiest during the whole civil rights struggle. And out of this was to come the first major street confrontations of the 1960s between blacks and the forces of racism. And this was the famous Battle of Birmingham in the spring 1963, which was led by masses of young black people who battled the dogs and hose pipes and, uh, of the police department of the famous Bo Connor, the police chief of Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham was followed by the largest mass demonstration ever, ever carried out in Washington, D.C. Till, till then. This was the famous March on Washington in which 250,000 demonstrators uh, participated. The significance of Washington was that it was perhaps the high point of the civil rights movement, a movement I am, that I am arguing tonight had its impetus with the civil rights decision of the Supreme Court on school desegregation in 1954. Now today, looking back on the Civil Rights Movement, there are many different opinions on the significance of this, of this movement. I'd like to address myself for a few minutes to the significance of that movement. First of all, the question of Jim Crow and these Jim Crow laws and our effort to get these laws taken off of the books. The question is sometimes said that our struggle was simply one 
of sitting at lunch counters next to white people, or perhaps sitting next to whites on buses, or perhaps having the opportunity to sit on the same toilet that white people had sat on. Such views and opinions of the civil rights movement miss the importance of Jim Crow laws and do not understand the reason why these laws existed. These were codes that were designed to instill into black people a sense of knowing our place by constantly reminding us that we were not equal to whites. Because if we were not equal, and we actually believed we were not equal, then we wouldn't expect to have the same things as whites. And this was perhaps the most important reason for the existence of these laws, to constantly remind us that we were not equal, and more importantly, to, rem to give us the feeling, they impressed upon us that we should not expect the same things as whites. We had to attack these laws. We had to attack them in order to raise the consciousness of black people, in order that black people would begin demanding more. You see, if you didn't believe, if you didn't believe you could sit anywhere you wanted to on a bus, then it was almost certain that you wouldn't expect to have the same wages as whites for the same job that is equal pay for equal work. If you didn't believe you had an elementary freedom to use any toilet that you so desired, then again it was unlikely that you would demand the right to vote or the right to equal education. Thus an attack on Jim Crow laws was a necessary step in moving the black struggle to demand more fundamental concessions from this political system. Our consciousness today as black people, and oftentimes we forget this, in terms of the demands that we make and what we expect from the United States had its origins in the gains of the civil rights movement, a movement that moved forward the consciousness of black people. It is sometimes said the civil rights movement did not attack the real issues, the real issues of discrimination the things that relegate black people to second-class citizenship within the United States, issues concerning the economic discrimination against black people. Well, as I've already tried to point out to you, and you have to remember and understand the consciousness of black people before the civil rights movement. We grew up in a system, especially in the South, where we were relegated to the back of the bus, where we were constantly reminded we were not equal, and therefore, we were highly unlikely to believe that we should receive equal pay for equal work. Thus, the Civil Rights Movement was instrumental in moving forward our consciousness. Another mistaken belief about the Civil Rights Movement is that is the charge sometimes made that it was a middle class movement. It was a movement by, led by the black middle class, people who already had the income to be able to sit next to whites in certain restaurants and certain lunch counters. Unfortunately, such a charge reflects ignorance about the South and the nature of struggles. It's important to really keep in mind that Jim Crow laws existed in order to discriminate against all blacks. They affected all blacks, middle class blacks and non-middle class blacks. And that was his purpose, to keep all blacks in their place. I thought I had had something with my bachelor's degree in 1963 when I attempted to register, but I was to learn that the Jim Crow laws were designed to affect all black people, no matter what your attainments, attainments had been in life. And that was its purpose, to constantly remind all black people that they were inferior and therefore should not expect much should not expect the same as black people. Thus, to the extent that the civil rights movement erased these laws and was successful in getting these laws off the books, then it was useful in awakening the consciousness of all black people. And for that reason, if nothing else, it was indeed a worthwhile movement. I think a valid criticism of the movement is that after 1964, and perhaps even earlier, it lost its independent character. Essentially, the movement was co-opted 
by the Democratic Party, first under the leadership of John Kennedy, and then under Lyndon Baines Johnson's, Johnson's leadership. Its more radical sections, such as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was popularly known as SNCC, made a number of tactical errors during that period, but more importantly, as recent revelations about the FBI indicate, the more radical sections of the civil rights movement were simply repressed. And I'm referring to the program that has recently come to light known as the counterintelligence program of the FBI that was under the uh, direction of the late J. Edgar Hoover, a program that was designed to disrupt black nationalist organizations. The co-optation process that I referred to, that is the process in which the civil rights movement was co-opted by the Democratic Party, I think is more significant and a bit more difficult to understand. The demands of the civil rights movement throughout the 1950s and 1960s was a source of concern and embarrassment to the national administrations. Blacks were demanding more and more and taking to the streets in mass demonstrations. Internationally, the United States was embarrassed by its racial problems. Because of the increasing radicalization of the movement, a movement that began on the program of gradualism, that is, gaining a few rights for blacks here and there, a movement that moved from a program of gradualism to a a movement that began uttering the slogan, slogan, freedom now, because the movement had moved in this direction, concessions had to be made by the national administrations. Firstly, the ending of the Jim Crow laws. This was accomplished in the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. John F. Kennedy had been very reluctant about having this bill passed, but because of the pressure of the Civil Rights Movement, the March on Washington in 1963, he decided and his successor decided that it would be necessary in order to keep blacks out of the streets, it would be necessary to get rid of these Jim Crow laws. Next, in 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. It was hoped that these two concessions would quieten the black movement, were still black people would get black people off of the streets. What the administrations failed to understand at that time, however, is that the logic of oppressed peoples in their struggles is that gains in one area tend to increase expectations and demands elsewhere. The national governments began to understand this logic particularly when northern cities began erupting, first in New York in 1964, Watts 1965, Detroit and Newark in 1967, Washington DC in 1968. I'm referring to the urban rebellions that took place in the late 60s. In the now famous Kerner Commission Report, the so-called Riot Commission Report of 1968, which was supposed to discern and to discover the causes of these urban rebellions, the authors of the report gave as an important cause what they call the rising expectations of blacks. That blacks be were beginning to feel that they deserved more while the system itself was unable to produce more. Social scientists refer to this as relative deprivation, a situation in which people's expectations are up here somewhere, but their reality is down here. And the gap between the two is referred to as relative deprivation. When the gap is very wide, frustrations increase. The Kerner Commission report said that this was one of the main causes for the urban rebellions. What had happened was that the civil rights movement had awakened black consciousness and expectations, a movement that owed its origins to the 1954 Supreme Court decision. It's no coincidence that Eisenhower, after he resigned and retired from the presidency, 
said shortly afterwards that had he known the Supreme Court that he appointed, that is the Warren Court, would have made this famous 1954 decision, he would never have appointed Warren to head the Supreme Court uh, when he did. What Eisenhower was saying essentially was that the repercussions of that decision were tremendous. And had he known the outcome of that, he would never have appointed Warren to the Supreme Court. Now the decision itself didn't simply bring about the Civil Rights Movement, but it contributed to the rising expectations, and then later the frustrations of black people, because it became increasingly clear that the national government would not implement the decision of the Supreme Court. It was this combination of rising expectations and frustrations that radicalized blacks. The national administrations understood this very well. In a now famous note that was leaked to the press in 1969, written by Daniel Moynihan, a top aide of the Nixon administration, it became quite clear what this administration's strategy was to be. One, create a climate in which black people would not have much hope in getting full equality and more gains, and at the same time to create the illusion that black people had already made it in American society. Thus, the strategy has been one of halting any more concessions to blacks and where possible to roll back on the gains that blacks have already made. This has been a national strategy, I submit. It's a strategy that has embraced all aspects of the black community, from the ghettos to blacks on campuses such as Iowa State University. The administrations understood very well what the black movement was doing to the United States, not only as far as the black community was concerned, but also for all social layers. It was no surprise and coincidence that out of the black movement were to grow large numbers of social movements. The student movement in the This movement of black people in the 60s and late 50s was a movement that had international repercussions. Very recently, I had a chance to speak to Bernadette Devlin of Northern Ireland, leader of the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, in which she mentioned that their movement was in many ways inspired by the struggle of black people in the United States. So this struggle was to be of extreme significance. And it was thus no surprise that the national administrations saw it necessary to begin thwarting this movement, to begin rolling back, to begin undermining it as much as possible. It was in this context that events in Boston, which began last fall, must be understood. Boston should and must be seen in this historical perspective, because otherwise we will miss its significance. It was clear that the Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson administrations were not very enthusiastic about granting full equality in education to black people. Nixon was most explicit about this. He made no bones about it. While the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration was hemmed and hard a bit, the Nixon administration was quite clear in his drive against full equality for blacks in education. Nixon's stance took the form of his drive against busing, his stance against busing for equal education. 
a drive which his successor, Gerald Ford, has continued. An attack on busing has now become the new form in which the attack on the black community has taken. The issues themselves are purposely confused in order to disguise the true nature of the attacks. You see, because as a result of the Civil Rights Movement, even the most virulent racists, such as George Wallace, no longer come out in the open today and say that they are against the black community. This just doesn't occur anymore except for a very few fringe groups, the majority of the racists no longer come out and make blatant statements as they once did against the black community. So attacks on the black community are disguised. They are camouflaged. And one of the ways in which the attacks on the black community have taken is the stance of the administrations against busing for equal education. Boston represents a showdown, in my opinion, between the forces of racism on one side and the forces of full equality for blacks on the other. The racists understand this very well. This is why Gerald Ford has taken a position on Boston that is against the black community. This is why he has given sanction to the racist violence in Boston. He comes out one day and says he is against the violence, but on the other hand says he is against busing. The racists understand, understand very well what Gerald Ford is mean, means. They see this as open license and open season on the black community. Boston has given a new lease to life on groups that we thought had disappeared. Groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, groups as the American Nazi Party. All of these groups have been revitalized as a result of the struggle in Boston. The Ku Klux Klan sees Boston as an opportunity to grow. Very recently announced a new policy. For the first time in its history, it is allowing Catholics into its organization. And the implications are quite clear. It's because most of the whites in South Boston are Irish Catholics. And because it sees this as an attempt, or at least a possibility for further recruitment, it has opened its doors to a group of people who seem to forget or do not know that the Ku Klux Klan started out or had as a part of its program anti-Catholicism. The American Nazi Party has been given a new lease on life. It is actively recruiting and active in the struggle in Boston. They have begun to make numerous appearances and have become more bold in their activities. Some of you may be aware of the fact that recently in Los Angeles, California, the headquarters of two radical organizations, the Socialist Workers Party and the Revolutionary Union, were recently bombed. And the Nazis in that city very proudly took credit for the bombing of, this, of these headquarters. Other reports suggest that the Nazis are making more frequent appearances. Boston has given a new, a new lease to life for these organizations. To appreciate the significance of Boston and its importance, imagine what would happen to the black struggle if the racists got their way. That is, if the racists won the struggle and said that the buses are not going to roll. That is, if they prevent the buses from rolling in Boston. The implications of this are tremendous, I suggest. Every racist around the country would interpret this as a victory against the black struggle. Everywhere, not only in Boston, but everywhere, they would see this as a victory. The basic issue in Boston is whether or not black people have the elementary right to send their children to any school they so desire. This is the basic political issue. This is the basic issue which Boston now presents to us. Right now, this basic political issue 
is expressed in its concrete form on the issue of busing. You see, it's very simple. If the buses do not roll, if the races prevent the buses from rolling, then they win. And black people are denied the elementary right from going to any school, having their children going to any school they so desire. That's the basic issue. If the races win, if the buses don't roll, that's what it means. Black people are denied a right. And in Boston right now, the black community has decided that it wants to exercise this particular right. Busing itself may, may not be in a great panacea. That is, we must not view it from an abstract level. But it is an option which the black community in Boston has decided that it wants to exercise in order to obtain equal education. And to let the racists win on this issue is to give encouragement to them to roll back other gains, not only in Boston, but elsewhere. Just as the black struggle was able to move forward because it defeated the racists in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, by winning the elementary right for black people to sit anywhere they so desired on a bus, the continued struggle for black equality, the continued struggle for black equality could very well move forward if it is successful in defeating the racists in Boston from preventing blacks in exercising the basic right of going to any school they so desire. The corollary of this is as follows. Just as the black struggle was able to move forward because it defeated the racists in 1955 in Montgomery, the struggle of the racists to defeat the gains of black people could very well move forward if they are successful in preventing black people from exercising this basic political right of attending any school that black people so desire. As I said, there are many confusing aspects to the struggle in Boston, and much of the confusion has been purposely created by the racists. It's bad enough that the racists actively encourage confusion, but it's unfortunate that so-called friends of the black community are also confused. One of the issues that is being debated in some circles by people who say they are friends of the black community is the question of quality education. The argument is made that the issue is not equal education, but quality education. That is that the schools in Boston are bad, are poor, and the question of black people obtaining equal education in such a school system is not very important. The question is quality education. Let me say that, and let me be most clear, I'm for quality education, and I support quality education wholeheartedly. On the other hand, many people are for quality education. I can't think of too many people who are against quality education. I'm sure George Wallace is for quality education. I'm sure Louise Day Hicks, the leader of the Boston Racists, is also for quality education. But the basic issue, the fundamental issue, is as I submit, is the question of whether or not black people have the fundamental right to go to any school they so desire. Let me offer an analogy. When we struggled in the South to integrate lunch counter facilities, we were not struggling around an effort simply to eat at Woolsworth because the food was better at Woolsworth than it was somewhere else. That was not the nature of our struggle. We struggled because we felt we had a basic right to eat at any lunch counter we so desired. And I submit that is the basic question in Boston, whether or not black people have this right. And if that right is denied, then I would argue that it is necessary for those people who support the equality of black people and full democratic rights for black people to support the black community in its struggle. The black community in Boston has decided, and I think this is most important, 
the black community in Boston has decided at this particular time that it wants to have that option, exercise the option of using buses to bring about equal education. Now some people argue that the school administration, the people who are pushing for busing are trying to divide white workers from blacks. It is sometimes argued that busing, all it is doing is whipping up racism amongst poor whites. And that the rich whites who live out in suburban Boston are playing a trick on the black community and the working class. And what they're doing is trying to pit black people against poor whites. Now, the problem I have with this particular argument is that one, it seems to suggest that the racism amongst masses of whites, masses of white workers, uh, is something that can be manipulated at any time. And that somehow these people are not responsible for their racism. And that somehow they're being manipulated by these upper and middle class whites and the bourgeoisie and so on who live out in the suburbs of Maryland. I'm concerned about this argument because it seems to exempt the white working class from its responsibility, which I argue is a responsibility of fully supporting the right of black people to go to any school that they so desire. If such people who put forth this argument are interested in what they call working class unity, then I submit that the best basis for working class unity is the evident and obvious and strong support on the part of white workers for a black equality. That is to support black people in their right for full and equal education in American system. This is the only basis on which unity can, unity can take place. We must not be led to believe that we must forge unity at any price. Unity is desirable, but only on a basis of equality between blacks and whites. And as long as white workers out in the streets in Boston trying to kill, lynch, and harm black people, I submit that is, there is no basis for working class unity on the basis of these kinds of actions. Another argument that is sometimes made is that it is useless and wrong for people who support blacks in Boston to call for federal troops to come into Boston to implement the court's decision calling for busing. I have problems with this argument uh, for a number of reasons. One of them, the argument is, that is put forward by such people is that one cannot rely on the federal government to come to the defense of the black community. I have troubles with this in view of my knowledge. It might be limited of the civil rights movement in a black history. But firstly, it was the presence of federal troops in the South after the Civil War that served as a basis for protecting black people. And it was the withdrawal of these troops that set into motion the period after the Reconstruction period in which the greatest amount of repression and violence toward black people occurred in American society. When I look back on 1957 Little Rock, I realize that it was only the presence of federal troops in Little Rock in 1957 that enabled nine black children to enter Central High School without fear of their lives. Right now in Boston, there's only one way in which this decision can be implemented and that is the presence of federal troops. And for black people who live in Boston, 
for the black students who are attending these schools, who have to face the violence on a day-to-day -day basis, they are quite clear what they want and what they require in their efforts, and that is indeed the presence of federal troops. A few weeks ago in Boston on February 14th through the 16th, 2,000 young people, primarily students, met at Boston University to decide and to plan what is the best course that students can play to support the black community and the rights of blacks in Boston. It was at that conference that an organization was formed called the National Student Coalition Against Racism whose purpose it is to defend the black community in Boston and elsewhere where the black community is faced with racism. It was also at that conference that the head of the NAACP in Boston announced that on May 17th, the date on which the 1954 Supreme Court decision was handed down, on May 17th, a national demonstration is being called for in Boston. The NAACP recognizes that at this particular point in time, it must supplement its legalistic approach to full equality for black people with a struggle in the streets. The NAACP recognizes that only the mass mobilization of black people and their supporters will bring about a victory for black people in Boston. The racists are mobilizing every weekend in Boston. Some of you may know about the demonstration that occurred in Washington the other day, in which 2,000 of them went to Washington for the purpose of putting pressure on Congress to pass a constitutional amendment that would ban busing as a means for desegregation of schools. You know, one of the things I'm always amazed about and always surprised to learn as I think about it more often and amuses me to some extent if it wasn't sad, is the fact that the racists somehow never mention that for 10 to 20 years, busing was used in Boston as a basis for segregation to maintain segregated schools. Blacks used to be bused past white schools near their neighborhoods to black schools across town in order to maintain segregated schools. So I find it amusing that these people are now calling for the implementation of a constitutional amendment to ban busing, but they quickly point out a, an amendment that would ban busing for the purposes of desegregating schools. Thus the racists are on the march. They have aligned themselves with the most reactionary forces at this time in American society the Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan, the people of West Virginia who are fighting the use of school books in their school system, all of these forces are aligned and are slowly moving. It is not surprising then that the NAACP sees it as necessary at this time for black people to get out into the streets. There was a time, you know, when we uh, thought that perhaps getting out in the streets there was useless, didn't do us too much, and we got too sophisticated and said that we must get out of the streets and work in the chambers of Congress and talk to our congressmen and our Congress people and in our local uh, back rooms in order to win concessions. What we are slowly beginning to learn as the history of the Civil Rights Movement reveals is that we've got to get back out in the streets. It was only because we were in the streets that we were able to win certain concessions. And it is only our return to the streets that will lead us to be able to defend those gains that we did make during that particular period. I urge all of you who are interested in supporting the struggle of black people for the fulfillment of fundamental democratic rights, in this case, the right to go to any school that the black community so desires, to become a part of the National Student Coalition Against Racism and to participate with us in what we see as an extremely important struggle at this particular point in the history 
of the black movement. Our past history indicates that only through struggle have we gotten concessions and only through struggle can we protect, can we protect what we have. A people who cannot defend the gains of the past cannot hope to go forward in the future. Let me end with the words I love to recite of another black leader from another time and another era whose words are as relevant today as they were when they were repeated and originally stated over 100 years ago. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without the thunder and the lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its mighty waters. The struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one or it may be both a moral and a physical one, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand it never did and it never will. Find out just what a people will submit to and you have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong that will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Thank you. I certainly see, as I suggested, that a success on the part of the black community in Boston, I think, will be a stimulant in the arm of the black struggle, which has been relatively nascent in the last few years. That is, uh, there has not been much motion in the black community in recent years around uh, the, uh, the struggle for full equality. And I see a success in Boston as being a stimulant in, that, in the arm. I don't see the question of uh, rising expectations necessarily leading to the kinds of urban rebellions that took place in black ghettos in the uh, late uh, 60s. I think there were important lessons that were learned by the black community as a result of those uh, rebellions. And I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily think, I don't think that these were a, a shot in the arm and the resurgence of the struggle would necessarily lead to that. But I think it will, uh, as your suggestion, as your question suggests, I think it certainly will indeed lead to a resurgence uh, of the black struggle. The theme of the May 17th demonstration in many ways represents this, the theme that was proposed by the NAACP Name that 21 years is long enough, referring to the 1954 Supreme Court decision, which has never been fully uh, implemented. And uh, I think it will be a successful uh, demonstration, and I see it as a, uh, as a, a very useful struggle in getting the black community active again. Boston, like most states, has a, uh, of course, a uh, tax allocation system that is un discriminates against uh, poor communities. Uh, they have, have a weak, communities have a weak tax base. And 
this is a problem that afflicts all school systems. A very uh, significant uh, case went before the Supreme Court not long ago in which uh, poor communities were, of course, not able to uh, obtain equal funding of uh, school systems. Only a few states like Minnesota that happens to have on the books, if not fully implemented, a law which requires an equal, dis a dis equal distribution. So generally, the overview, the general situation is that the inner city schools and the schools within Boston itself are relatively poor because of the weak, the weak tax base. The, uh, what many people have failed to understand is that even within, the, uh, that within Boston itself, where you have a generally poor school system vis-a-vis -vis the surrounding suburban communities, is that uh, uh, blacks still are on the short end of that poor educational system. That is, the broad picture within Boston is a school system in that is poor, but at the same time, blacks are in the uh, in an inferior position as far as the quality of education is concerned within that school system. And the black community rightfully is asking, why should blacks have a monopoly always on the worst schools? And if this uh, school system is uh, poor, black people say that uh, we should spread this around. Why should we have a monopoly on it? It doesn't mean that a fight for quality education should not take place. But the black community is saying that we will fight for quality education, let us equalize what we have. And then we can move forward with the white community for a, a better educational system. The, I, I mentioned the quality education thing because it's, uh, it's a, uh, a charge you hear oftentimes. And, uh, one that I'm always, as I said, I'm dubious of and concerned about. One, I do not know of any instance in which the masses of whites in Boston have demonstrated, created the fear they have for quality education. That is, the whole thrust of their movement has been to keep blacks out of their schools. They have not waged a struggle for quality education, which makes me a bit suspicious of the claim that they're only interested in quality education. The brunt of their attack has been on the black community. Why is it they saw it necessary to hang a black man, to almost hang a black man, as uh, necessary in order to bring about quality education uh, uh, leaves me uh, wondering. Why is it that almost 100 black students were almost lynched on December the 11th in South Boston High School by a community that says it's concerned with quality education? Uh, strikes me as a, a bit odd. I have